Oh, thank goodness, finally some hacking. Hey everyone, and welcome back to the channel. Today we are going to start the SQL injection portion of the video series, which means yes, we finally are going to start hacking. Before we get into that though, we're gonna to need to update the Git repository that we've been using for this video series. If you haven't been following along in the video series, I'll post a link to the rest of the playlist down below in the description. If you have been following along, the only thing you need to do is a Git pull inside the SQL for Hackers directory. That will grab the latest lab files for you. Obviously, I've been working on it, so my Mine's already up to date. If we move into the Docker directory, we'll see that the SQL primer Docker file has been moved into the SQL primer directory. And there's a new directory called SQL I site. We move into that. We'll see that there are two more directories and a Docker compose file. If you're not familiar with Docker compose, don't worry. It's just another way to launch Docker containers. In this case, I'm launching multiple containers, both the database and a web server. So it's easier for me to orchestrate that with Docker compose. In previous videos, we haven't used Docker compose though. So if you don't have Docker compose already, you can get that with just an apt install Docker dash compose and a dash Y. I already have it, so I didn't need to install it, but if you didn't already have it, this would just take a minute. Once that's working though, we can do a docker-compose space up minus D, and this will just take a second to download the images and run the containers. I already have the images downloaded, so it didn't take me as long, but it will take about a minute for you. We can make sure that the containers are running by doing a docker container ls. We can see that both of them are running, and we can see that our web server is running on port 8000. We'll open up our web browser, Make it a little bigger and we'll go to 127.001 port 8000. And that will redirect us to the basic.php. So I think one of the things that people struggle with when they first get into web app penetration testing is not necessarily taking advantage of vulnerabilities, but finding vulnerabilities in the first place. So what you wanna be looking for is something that obviously either pulls from a database or writes into a database. And in this case, we have a search field that if we put in the first name of a crew member, so we'll put it in Alex, we get back information about Alex or known Alex's. We can infer based on our experience with databases from the past couple videos that this is going into a database, searching for the input that we gave it and then returning rows or results from that database. So step one, finding a way to interact with a database on a web app. How we test for actual SQL injection or the ability to inject into a SQL database, all SQL injection is, is the web application and the database itself processing our input as SQL content, not as search strings. There's a few things we can infer about this web application and database without doing any SQL injection at all. So first we know that we're going to input a first name and what's going to be returned is the matching name and an email address. And we can see that down below where it's giving us what looks like the first name and an email address. The reason I spent two videos walking you through setting up MySQL and understanding SQL on the back end is because a lot of times when when you're dealing with SQL injection, it's useful to open up a database on the back end and actually mimic what's happening. So let's do that right now. We're going to docker exec ti and we're going to exec into the database container. So we'll grab this database name and we'll exec into bin bash. And since we're in the container, we already know that the client tools are already installed. So we'll go ahead and use MySQL dash U root minus P. I'm going to open up another terminal real quick. And if you look at the Docker compose file, you'll see that the root password for the database is my bad pass surrounded in exclamation points. We can close this. And when it asks us for the password, we can do bang my bad pass bang. So we don't know what the database or the table is right now, but we can already infer based on the stuff that we see on the web page that the query is something like select first name, email address from, we'll call it a directory because that's the name of the page where first name equals input. And it's gonna look something like this. So when we're looking for SQL injection, I think one of the easiest things to do in a lot of situations is just to put in a backtick or a single quote. When you do that and hit enter, for certain websites, you'll get an error back from the page itself and you'll actually see the SQL error. Anytime you see a SQL error, that means that the database is processing your input 
as SQL content. And if it's processing your input as SQL, then you can give it SQL commands. And we'll go over kind of how to do that in a minute. But this is the ultimate indicator that SQL injection can happen. But what happens if it doesn't give you this SQL error? Well, I have a different page called errorless on the same server where it does exactly that. If I put in a quote, it comes back with zero results. We can get a little bit tricky here and generate content that will allow us to infer that it is processing SQL without actually telling us that it's processing the SQL. So instead of doing that, we can we can type in Alex and we know that Alex will give us some results back. If we do Alex, it won't give us results back because there is no AL space EX first name. However, if we do AL single quote space single quote EX, what's happening inside of SQL is that there is no space between the L and the E in the string. There's only a space between the single quotes. It will treat these as concatenated strings. If you think about JavaScript or Python or anything like that, it's the equivalent of doing something like this, where you do AL single quote plus single quote EX. It's just concatenating the strings. So when we run this, we get back Alex. That means that it's processing our input as SQL. And that's allowing us to infer that SQL injection is available to us. Now, what happens if it doesn't even give us this amount of feedback? Well, that's called blind SQL injection. And we're going to go over blind SQL injection in the advanced video, which is going to come out next week. Now, once you understand that your input is being taken as SQL, you can start to craft different types of exploits that do different things. And the first thing that comes to mind is bypassing business logic. And all that means is that we're going to leverage the SQL injection to make the application do something that it wasn't quite meaning to do. And there's really one major example that comes to mind for everybody, and I'll show it to you in two different ways. I'm sure everybody's seen this, where it's single quote or one equals one semicolon dash dash space. In order to understand what this is doing, let's flip back over and we'll close this because we don't need it. We're actually going to go into the database itself so that I can illustrate what exactly this is doing for us. So we're going to use the T web app database and we're going to set up the actual query. Now, before I spelled out first name and email address because we were guessing what the query was going to be, I wrote the query, I wrote the web app, so I don't need to guess. So it's F name, and we're also gonna select email from directory, where F name equals, and this is where our input goes. Now this is the actual query that's ran after you hit submit on that web server. So what we're doing is we're putting all of our input between these two single quotes. So the first thing we have is a single quote. We say, or one equals one. If we just hit enter here, we have something called unbalanced quotes. We actually have an extra quote here and the database is actually expecting there to be another quote to end this string. And if we just hit enter, it actually complains about this. So let's try this again. And that is the purpose of doing the semicolon and the dash dash space. The dash dash space is telling it that there's a comment after this, which means to ignore everything in the SQL statement after the dash dash. And that gets rid of that extra quote that we can't get rid of. So we just comment it out and we put our own semicolon there to end the SQL statement. The one equals one. Well, let's do this without the one equals one. If we just do this, which is the same as this. So if we just have an empty input, that means that it's going to return every row where the F name is blank, which is zero. However, what we're doing with the one equals one is that the database is going row by row and seeing if F name is blank, which it isn't, there are no records where the F name is blank, or does one equal one? Well, one does equal one, so we're gonna return that record. Next row, is F name blank? No. Does one equal one? Yes, return that record, and so on, all the way down the table. We're not modifying the table that's being queried. That's happening way over here outside of our quotes. We're not changing the database, nothing. We're just going through the table that is selected by the query and checking each row if one equals one. So when we hit enter here, we get everything. And if we hit enter here, we get everything. The other example that I have for you is using the or one equals one, but we're going to check it out in a login page. And this is what I mean by subverting business logic. We are taking the business logic, which is going to be something like match the row where username equals 
and password equals. And if you get a result, then you can log in as that person. So what we're going to do here is we're going to type in Jay Holden because he is the captain of the Tachi or the Rosinante as it later becomes called. And we want to log in as Jay Holden, but we don't know his password. So what we can do, and you're going to see this blacked out, but single quote space or one equals one semicolon dash dash space. And we see here that it says, welcome Jay Holden. And just to prove to you that it's the SQL injection that's working, I just didn't type in his password. I can put in just anything here and it says username or password invalid. So we're utilizing this same string to bypass authentication. This is very common in CTFs, but I don't see this specific attack working very often in the wild. There are other ways to abuse login forms with SQL injection, but this is just not a very common one outside of examples and basic CTF challenges. Moving back to the basic page, there's a slightly more elegant way that I do that same attack that doesn't require the semicolon dash dash. And what that is, is this. Now, what this is doing is, is achieving the same thing, but it's actually balancing the quotes inside of our query rather than trying to comment out the rest of the query. This has two benefits. The first is that it uses less characters, and I don't mean that it is shorter in the number of characters that you have to type. What I mean is that the number of different or the number of unique characters is lower. A lot of times developers try and generate security filters, but don't necessarily do it the correct way. And we will be covering how to mitigate SQL injection in a couple videos. What they'll do instead is they'll filter out bad characters. The more ways we know to execute, the more flexible we are when we generate our attacks and the more consistently we can evade filters. If we take a look at this, the same payload, but written slightly differently in the database, once again, we're only typing the things between the two outer single quotes. So we've got these two are provided by the web app. And then we type in the single quote space or space single quote one, single quote equals single quote one. And that's all we're typing. It's leveraging the quotes that are provided by the web app and balancing the quotes naturally. Well, let's move on to something a little more complex and a little more useful. What if we wanted to find out what other tables existed in a database or what other databases we have access to? We don't necessarily want to be stuck in the table that was pre-selected for us by the web app developer. The way we're going to do that is with the union select statement in SQL. What that looks like as a refresher from previous videos is that we have a normal select statement. So we'll just use the previous one we were using. And we'll say Alex and we'll union select email and comment from comments. It's important to remember that union select needs to select the same number of columns with each union select. Additionally, each column needs to match in data type for the most part. MySQL tends to be a little more fuzzy with this. Other databases are a little more strict where if you have a column that returns in integer, then anything in the union select for that column needs to be an integer as well. But how do we go about doing a union select through SQL injection? Well, there's a few steps. The first step is to get an idea of what our intended output looks like. So if we just type in Alex, we see that it's returning two fields or two columns. One is the F name and one is the email address. Those are both strings. So we understand that we need to make sure that our union select returns two strings. What we need to do is figure out what data we even want access to. So our next step is to start mapping the database. And the first step of doing that is fingerprinting which database we're working with. In this series, we've been using MySQL. So we already know what database we're working with. But if we didn't know, then there's a series of ways that we can kind of tell. Every database has a slightly different metadata setup. They have a series of tables that contain metadata about the database, and every database is laid out slightly differently. What we can do then is try and select from those metadata tables. If one doesn't work, move on to the metadata table of the next type of database. We're not going to go over every single database because there are plenty of cheat sheets on the internet. So we're just going to query directly from what the MySQL one looks like. So what we're going to do is we're going to try and dump out the list of tables available to us. We're going to start our union select and we're going to ask for table name and table schema, table schema in this case just being the database that the table belongs to, from information schema, 
which is the meta database for MySQL dot tables. And in this case, since we can't balance the quotes ourselves, we're going to do the semicolon dash dash space. And when we hit enter, we'll see all of the different tables that are available to us. You notice that it's not saying table name, database name here. We're within the confines of the way that the web app developer wrote the web application and defined the query. This is one of the reasons that we need to make sure that our union select has the same number of columns as the original query does, because otherwise there wouldn't be anywhere to display those additional columns. As we scroll through this, we don't really need to pay attention to the information schema results. Sometimes they're useful, but oftentimes they're not. We could clean this out a little bit by doing a where table schema not equal to blah. Otherwise, we can just scroll past it. And we can see down here, we're getting into the T web app and then also something called secrets. So that might be interesting later. And I'll show you how to query other databases here in a second. But for now, let's just focus on the T web app database and specifically the users table. That is generally the name of tables where usernames and passwords are stored, other types of credentials like hashes or keys, etc. So so anytime you see a users table, your ears should perk up a little bit. Now, the next thing we want to know is what the columns for these tables are. So let's set up a union select again. And this time we're going to say that we want the column name and the data type because we want to match the results to the data types that are listed in our table from information schema dot columns where table name equals and here we can actually balance our quotes a little bit where the table name equals users and we hit enter so we can see that there is an id field a username field a password field and an email field we only have access to two columns so we just pick two of them. And frankly, the username and password columns are the ones that we want the most. If we really wanted email or there was another couple columns here that we really wanted, what you may end up having to do is three separate queries where you say, give me the username and password, and then give me the username and email address, and then the username and ID because that way I can tie each of the rows to the corresponding username. So now that we know what column names we want from the users table, we can set up our union select to dump that specifically. So we're gonna close out the previous query. We're gonna do our union select. And the two columns that we want are username and password from the users table. And we could do a where like one equals one so we can balance out our quotes, but that's not super important in this case. So we can just do the colon dash dash space. And here we have the username and the password for every user in the database. But what about this secrets database with the top secret table associated with it? How do we access that? That is a different database. So we need to think of something a little bit different, but you've already been targeting other databases with this information schema. So you kind of already know how to do this. So let's figure out what columns are available in this secrets database with the top secrets table. We're going to do the same union select that we did before. We'll do column name and data type from information schema dot columns where table name equals and we want the top secret table. And here we have a user and role. So it looks like some sort of database tracking users and kind of what roles they have. So now we want to do a union select similar to the previous username and password union select that we had, but targeting a different database. So we want to select the user and the role from, and we're going to do a database dot table syntax. So we want to grab the database, the secrets database dot top secret table semicolon dash dash space. And here we can see that there are some users that are being tracked and kind of what their role is. And here we can even see that some credential information is associated with this user. I see a lot of times databases are overloaded with information. Non-sensitive databases have sensitive data in them and vice versa. And it's not, even though this looks a little contrived, it's not that out of the realm of possibility. 
there you have it. From seeing a search field to detecting the presence of SQL injection to mapping out the database to gathering sensitive information, both from other tables as well as from other databases, you now know the basics of quite a bit of the SQL injection that I've carried out throughout my career. In the next video, we're going to be covering more advanced SQL injections, such as blind SQL injection, out of band SQL injection, and even automating your own binary inference without SQL map, writing your own Python that is super easy to understand and we'll walk through it step by step. Thanks for sticking around through the end of this video. If you like this video, check out our other CTF walkthrough videos as well as the latest and greatest from the channel.